Hey YouTube, we're going to do a video today on the circular saw. Now I know what you're thinking, how much is there to a circular saw to do a video on? Well, I think there's more to it than you might know. I'm going to go over a number of assists that I used or jigs that I used with my circular saw and I'm going to go over a modification I made to my circular saw and I'm going to go over just some practical information I think that would be a help to uh, most of us, if not all of us. So you stick right with me and I'll uh, get started. Before we start cutting up wood, I want to cover some basic tips and uses that I'm aware of and perhaps others have ideas they might want to add uh, as I'm certainly not the authority. I just want to share what I have found over the years. Now the circular saw was invented in the 1920s. It was called the electric hand saw. That's how it was patented. In the first generation of production, less than 10 were made and from, from what I've read, half of those went to Atlantic City to help build the boardwalk. And the other half went out to California where a housing boom was going on. Now, most circular saws we use today are direct drive or sidewinders, as they're often called. But the first ones were worm driven, meaning the blade is not directly driven off the motor shaft as the motor sits sideways and a worm gear is used to change the direction of turn and it reduces the speed of the blade. Now, these worm drive versions have a higher torque and are mostly popular with framers. Now the sidewinders, they came about in order to get around a patent where they uh, uh, attached the blade directly to the uh, output shaft on the motor. These models, these sidewinders, have come to dominate the market. That's what you're just going to see mostly on the shelf and mostly for use out in the field. Now I've used a number of models over the years, typically from co-workers and so forth, but the main one I have owned and used for decades is the Makita 7 and a quarter. In fact, I'm still using the same model I bought way back when. All right, let's talk about safety for a minute. Now, anytime you're using a tool which has the potential to do serious bodily harm, it is wise to learn the do's and don'ts. It seems most problems happen under three circumstances. Your workpiece pinches the blade and the saw starts to buck. Number two, you're cutting something in an unconventional way such as overhead or you're reaching down inside of a, uh, underneath the house. These are always a situation that can lead to a uh, kickback. So you gotta be very careful when you're doing that. The other situation is the front of the base is not firmly resting on the workpiece. It's not a chainsaw. You can't just dive into the work with it, you know? So you never wanna have your foot or your hand or your arm across the path of the rear of that saw because that's exactly where it comes back to. Now, if you start having a problem where your guard starts getting hung up, fix it right away. Don't put it off. I, you know, I've had this same situation where sometimes my guard would get hung up. It, w it wouldn't uh, retract back in place. And I would put it off. And I can tell you, it's dangerous. Uh, one time I remember I was remodeling in a dental office and I cut something and set my saw down on the good doctor's carpet and it cut a half circle right in the guy's carpet. Well, you know, that, that uh, was an unfortunate situation. Another time, I was out cutting up, uh, I think I was cutting some countertops out on a job all by myself at night at a, at a house. And I made a cut and my guard got hung up and I brought my saw down next to my leg and that thing cut about a four inch slot right in front of my pants but it didn't cut me but it did scare the crap out of me and make me realize what's what a situation I would have been in had that thing got into my thigh out there all by myself at night so when you have a problem with a guard really any guard you should address it right away because you can't assume that just because you know it's getting hung up sometimes somebody else that picks up that tool they'll be aware of it too. So for everybody's safety's sake, just take care of that. Blades. Carbide blades are the standard now. 
Uh, but I recall my first job as a carpenter's helper when I was a teen. The boss would on occasion send, send me to go get his carbide blade, you know, as if that was really something special. I guess uh, this was reserved for when cutting into floors or something where nails might be. But now carbide blades are everywhere. You hardly even see steel blades. Uh, in fact, I threw out a bunch of them a few years ago because they just really didn't have any use for them. The simple rule for blades is the fewer the teeth, the rougher the cut. Now let's talk about extension cords. This is huge. Anytime you have an electrical tool which uses a lot of amps, you must use a heavier gauge cord if you're going to be doing any amount of cutting or running that cord for any distance. I can't tell you how many people's houses I go over and they have that cheap uh, flea market 50 foot cord hooked up to their miter saw or something. You're killing your motor. It's not intended to run. You know, hook your Christmas lights up, but not a high amp item like a, a circular saw or a miter box or anything that carries a lot of current. Repair people tell me the one thing that kills these electric tools the most is running these long skinny cords on a high amp item. It just eats them up. So get yourself a decent extension cord and don't use more cord than you need. Now, uh, over the years, I've changed the cords on my saws as they've worn out. Usually, what I do is they typically will come with an 8-foot cord. I usually will put a 10-foot cord somewhere around there because, you know, a lot of times you're ripping down a piece of 8-foot plywood, you got an 8-foot cord, you know what's going to happen. Your cord's going to get caught. So, I never buy an actual replacement cord. Usually what I do is I buy like maybe a 50-foot good extension cord. And I'll cut 10 feet off of there, I'll put that on my saw, and I'll buy another end and I'll put it on the, the remainder of the cord and use it for an extension cord. Uh, that's worked out pretty good for me. Advice. What advice could I give for somebody looking to buy a saw? Uh, it's been, I'll tell you the truth, it's been a long time since I've, I've uh, been in the market for looking for a saw. But the features I tend to like are a aluminum base plate. I don't like the stamped metal ones too much. Uh, so I do like that. I also prefer the lever release in the front that sets the bevel on the saw. Although my saw doesn't have it, whenever I've used those, Milwaukee's have them and a few others, I really like that feature. A cheap circular saw will have sleeve bearings or cheap bearings, and you don't, you don't want uh, you know something like that. You want one with good ball bearings. I had a customer once who hired me to help him put a room addition on, and... He was, you know, the agreement was he was going to do some of the work. And as I recall, he had a brand new skill saw. It was like an anniversary model or gold model or something. He was all excited to use it. The first day we were out there cutting, his saw seized up. You know, the motor was kind of running, but the blade wasn't. So I'm not saying all skill saws are cheap. Maybe that was just a bad one. But, you know, don't think that you're going to buy a $15 circular saw and you're going to get a lot of service out of it. If I were buying a, a circular saw today and uh, I was tight on money, I would go on Craigslist and buy a better quality one, a Makita or whatever, you know, a DeWalt. You can kind of look at them and see if they've been beat up and then you can test them to see if the motor sounds like it's running good. So that's what I would do. Now one thing a lot of people aren't really aware of is that all these quality electric tools have brushes inside of them. When those brushes wear out, the tool will start to sound like it's gurgling, or it might not even start at all. And what happens is those little brushes wear down, and that's it. But you can take the, there's little caps on the motor. Usually there's two. You take them off, and you, there's a spring inside of there. And at the end of that spring, there's a little block. It's not actually a brush. But you can replace those brushes and have many more years out of your saw. So, I mean, it's even possible to buy an electric tool that's doing that and it just needs brushes. I've replaced my brushes on my table saw mostly. I don't know why they seem to go through them more than any. But uh, so always be mindful when you're running that saw and it sounds like it's gurgling it's probably your brushes might be going. Let's talk about accessories. You're limited on accessories with a circular. Though lately a number of high priced tracks are available to function kind of as a sliding cutoff jig so to speak some of the longer ones you could rip you know eight foot 
uh, sheets of plywood or whatever. But uh, I'll go over some of the some of the jigs or accessories that I've used. I've found very helpful. Most I've made myself. But I'd be interested to see if somebody else has jigs or something that they've come up with that helps them with their circular saw. So let's get started. 